name is John Carlson. I'm the Senior Vice President for Cybersecurity Regulation and Resilience at the American Bankers Association. I am pleased to be joined with Susan Kosky, who is the CISO and Head of Enterprise Information Security at PNC Financial Group. Today, we're going to have a fireside chat discussion around some of the top of mind issues that financial CISOs are considering. Today, we're going to have um, a number of conversations around the top cyber and operational risks, the challenges financial institutions face as they rely more heavily on cloud service providers, some public-private collaborative efforts with the U.S. Treasury Department, financial regulators, and the cloud service providers to address some of these challenges. We're going to then talk about how AI is impacting the financial sector, including impact on cyber as well as fraud. And then we'll close with a little crystal balling and look into the future. So first, I'd like to ask Susan to provide a little bit more background about her role at PNC. Susan? Well, thank you, John. It's great to be with you here today. So at PNC, our enterprise information security team covers many different facets of information security, all the way from our fusion center, where we're looking at cyber, fraud, and physical events, to our application security, our policy, our governance, how we protect data, and how we look at lighting up the cloud in an appropriate, secure way. So our team covers the gamut of those different areas and Looking forward to the questions John has. Awesome. Thank you, Susan. So first, as a CISO of a major financial services firm, what are the top cyber and operational risks that keep you up at night and what you're focusing on in order to mitigate them? So I would say, John, there's a, a couple different areas that we all are facing. And if you look at the threat environment that we're in, uh, I think it's it's a sustained, complex threat environment that's only going to continue to be more complex and more, and more sustained and even maybe higher levels of risk. The threats that we see are you know not only domestic but they're foreign as well, and these risks can be from ransomware. They can be from exploiting vulnerabilities, which we've seen that grow relative to phishing. Phishing, not only for employees, but also how are criminals targeting customers to get customer information and try to take over customer accounts, as well as the rapid development of artificial intelligence, the things that it's bringing relative to deep fakes, whether those be voice or video or even pictures. And how do we address cyber risk from that rapidly evolving disruptive technology? These are the things that we're facing. And the things that we need to do is across our industries, not only within our industry, but outside the industry, is rapidly share information and be agile on what the techniques, tactics, and procedures that are being used out there and share those capabilities and work together. And you have to have those capabilities to share so that you can understand those and adjust anything you may need to relative to those risks that you're facing. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of moving parts that you have to manage. I'm just curious as it relates to how you're deploying and using cloud service providers, can you tell us a little bit about some of the specific tools and methodologies and strategies that you find are the most helpful or effective in securing the cloud ecosystem? So the cloud ecosystem, what you have to really think about there is a mindset shift. It requires a new way of thinking about security and a new way of adapting. When you look at the pipelines that are building resources in the cloud, infrastructure as code was the same thing for security. Security as code. How are those things baked in automated as part of that baking in and what can you do to if someone's trying to go uh, the analogy i always use if i have a lamborghini and i'm driving really fast on the malibu highway um, it's got seat belts airbags brakes but is there something that can course correct it and not allow it to drive off of the malibu highway and those things are you know implementing controls where possible that enforce the policy so that you can't drift off the highway. Those are the things that you need to look into and determine how you make them security as code 
and enforce that policy at the utmost level in, in depending upon which cloud service provider that you're using. In addition to that, you you have to have your teams think differently. And sometimes you'll see that people want to use non-native cloud capabilities. It's hard to do that and not lean into what the cloud provider has, but that also means that your team has to learn those and or you need to bring in people that have actually had those cloud skills and train them up potentially even in security if they came from an infrastructure background. And then you mentioned tooling. I think the other thing too is how do you constantly know that you're measuring the posture of that environment? There are tools out there that will do that, some native to the provider, some that you can purchase, but really helping you understand your control set, what is set via enforcement, what's detective, and what needs to you know be addressed if it's not in the state that you expect it to be. Great. Well, you know, that reminds me of a report that the U.S. Treasury Department published about a year ago in which they had reached out to a lot of experts and practitioners within the industry to talk about how cloud is being used in the financial services sector. And they laid out about a half a dozen significant challenges that financial firms are grappling with as they migrate to the cloud or even consider using cloud service providers. Um, so I want to talk a little bit on just to frame it for folks on this webinar. I mean, some of those challenges were insufficient transparency for the due diligence process, some challenges with negotiating contracts, given that there is a high degree of concentration in the cloud computing market. There's also issues around, you know, audit rights uh, for doing, you know, as part of that due diligence process. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the role that you play and your colleagues play at PNC in the what's called the Financial Services Sector Coordinating Council. And uh, for our viewers, that is a council that was established about 20 years ago to really bring together industry leaders to address cybersecurity and financial resiliency issues. And the physic and through the leadership of Susan and her colleagues at PNC have been uh, involved in a number of work streams to address some of those challenges that were laid out in the U.S. Treasury report through what is truly a unique public-private partnership. So I want you to tell us a little bit about, um, about that partnership, how it's going, what you think the outcome is going to be, both for financial institutions, but also for the cloud service providers that are also involved. So thank you, John, for that background on the Financial Services Sector Coordinating Council or FISIC. What we're seeing there is, is really this collaboration between public and private. As far as the key things that you mentioned earlier, you know, what would we be, what might we expect as outcomes coming out of there? And what would be our yield? You know, we're looking for common taxonomy in terms. Does A equal A equal A across the cloud service providers and how the regulators may see that? In addition to that, you know, how do we all measure the maturity of what we've developed and what we have in the cloud? So a common framework, a common industry standard to do that, in addition to what exists with things like the cloud control matrix from the Cloud Security Alliance. The other thing, too, is around incident response. When you think of the, the potential concentration risk around cloud services, how do we all know what that is and how do we recover quickly? Not only for our sector, but for multiple sectors that may rely on that. And the other thing, too, that I think we can possibly see out of this is how can we enable people using these cloud services that may have different skill sets, different budgets across our industry and others to really have things secure by design at the beginning? Could we get to a one-click capability that allows that? So if you know you set this, then you know the things that would be most impactful are addressed. These are the things we're working through to try to have things and artifacts that people can use, not only in their contract negotiations, but actually in their implementations, as well as their response when something does go bump in the night. 
Yeah, I, I think that's a great point because, um, you know, just from where I sit working in a financial trade association, I mean, I hear the concerns from my member banks about some of the challenges in working with cloud service providers. And in many respects, this public-private uh, collaboration is really driving towards a greater understanding uh, from the CSPs as to what the needs of the financial customer base and making the banks even more sophisticated in terms of what to ask for, what to look for in order to, to secure um, their, their cloud instances and their cloud adoption. Um, where do you think, you know, this has been going on now for almost a year. How's it going? Are we making progress? What, what do you think is going to be like the big, the big takeaways at the end of this process? I think that we've been making consistent progress. I think the big takeaways are going to be how do we collectively as a sector respond when there is an issue that affects more than one institution. I think there's also going to be benefit in what is secure by design and templates and things that people can pick up and use. In addition to that, templates and industry frameworks that people can leverage or even in another industry consortium, uh, such as the Cyber Risk Institute, that people could even leverage their outputs and capabilities as part of their maturity measurement. So there's gonna be a lot of materials that will be published and made available that people can use as things that they're considering during negotiation, in implementation, and then in after implementation. Great, yeah, I think that will be really helpful and valuable. Do you think the regulators are going to make any sort of changes as a result of you know, hearing what the industry, both the financial firms as well as the cloud service providers are saying? Do you think you'll see any sort of change in how they approach uh, the way they examine uh, cloud service providers as significant um, service providers to banks? Or do you think they'll put more pressure on banks to change the way they oversee cloud service providers? I think that the, well, I cannot necessarily speak for what the regulators may or may not do, but I think that in their shoes, it's tough, right? They have to make sure that we as financial institutions are doing what we need to for our customers. And I would still expect that to continue to occur. I think though that the regulators also want to make sure that the same and equal is, is happening at the cloud service providers, again, that are, may not just be impacting our industry, that may be impacting other industries. And I think the most critical thing that I see is that awareness and concern about how we do that and, and light up the beauty of it, but in a way that doesn't impact the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, Obviously, the last year we've heard so much about artificial intelligence, uh, certainly since uh, ChatGPT and the rise of generative AI and, and great, greater use of large language models. Um, you may recall last October, the White House released its sweeping executive order on artificial intelligence with a heavy focus on you know, ensuring that it's trustworthy, that it safeguards privacy, that it doesn't create excessive risk, you know, to industry and to the general public. Um, and that has led to another public-private collaboration that the Treasury Department was tasked in that executive order to write a paper on the impact of AI on cybersecurity and other issues, third-party risk management, fraud, uh, things of that nature. Um, and so it raises some questions around how do financial practitioners, you know, not only embrace artificial intelligence for a lot of positive purposes, but also how do you mitigate the risks associated with uh, the fact that adversaries will now have access to these mm -hmm. tools and could use those in ways that could harm uh, not only institutions, but as you mentioned earlier on, your direct customers as well. So tell us a little bit about what you're thinking about how to respond and deal with the AI revolution. I look at the AI revolution, you know, threefold. How do you leverage the capabilities for the business? 
how do you leverage the capabilities for your own cyber team as defenders? And then what are the adversaries going to do to leverage those capabilities? So relative to your own business needs, you you really need to have the right guardrails from a policy perspective, a model perspective, make sure what's coming out of there is working in its intended way, not creating a hallucination type of effect. And the best way to use it in in a, in a safe way, but that is business enabling because many folks are using that to be business enabling. But doing it in a way that doesn't create a risk to the business that may be different than a cyber risk, where maybe the model does something unintended that that impacts what you thought it was, was doing for you. So I think that's really, really critical in that realm. As far as the cyber defense side, it's really about looking across your information security team and understanding where might that be applicable. And then using that in a way that make your defenders faster and continue to look at how adversaries are using those tools. I think the adversary manifestation of this is going to be around voice, as well as picture and video. And when you think about, you know, impersonation of potentially customers or finding ways to trick customers and even trying to, um, we've seen this happen overseas. Uh, There was an incident overseas where individual got a phishing email, clicked on the link, thought they were actually talking to the CEO, CFO in a very lifelike representation of both of them in a call and wired money out, like $25 million, I think it was, U.S. So it's not only against our customers, it could be against employees too, trying to trick them. So then we have to say, how do we use those technologies to test our capabilities to defend or protect against them and our own employees recognition of, well, that just doesn't seem right. That would never really happen. We wouldn't expect that to occur. Yeah, that was a rather chilling example and uh, clearly a, a a new risk that organizations and individuals are going to have to contend with. Um, let's talk a little bit about the future, you know, where you think uh, financial sector use of cloud service providers um, how AI is going to impact, you know, the industry, you know, going forward. Say if we were to get together a year from now or maybe two years from now, w- what do you think we're, we're going to be talking about? So there are times where I often think of, you know, movies where this has actually come true. Um, and you would thought that, you know, maybe those things were further out, but they're here. Um, relative to AI and and computers doing things that we maybe hadn't imagined they were going to do. I think it's the rapid development of those things, you know, well exceeding Moore's law and and what, you know, what's happening there, the rapid development of it, but how you're also using that rapid development for your own benefit. But in security, we've always adapted to disruptive tech. You know, every time something new came out, bring your own device. All those things throughout the years, we've always adapted to that. I think that we'll continue to see that. We'll have companies really trying to make sure that they have the right guardrails around the sound practices, which there were many things in that white in that paper from the executive order that talked about that too. Um, but I also think that this is, you know, when you think of quantum computing, right, that's next as far as the next really disruptive item and all the data that's there and how we protect the data. So I think that we're always going to be kind of adjusting to those rapid capabilities. If you ask me where I think we could be in two years, you know, are we at a point in two years where these are so good that they've we've been able to use them to allow our defenders to to do things in a in a faster way and are we also 
allowing then our defenders to do some other interesting things because of that. So allowing the machines to do what the machines can do do, and allowing the humans to do what they can do, but the machine cannot. Those are, I think, where it's going to it's going to go. I would still anticipate that you're going to see more deep fake capabilities and then you're going to see the converse of that in detecting and defending against the deep fake capabilities. Yeah. You know, really glad you mentioned quantum computing because that has obviously been a, a, a topic that is starting to garner more attention within the financial services industry, particularly around the concern that quantum computers may undermine or break uh, commonly used encryption algorithms that are important for communications and payments and things of that. And it's it's leading to a conversation around how do you ensure you have an agile system where you can swap out, you know, suspect encryption algorithm with the NIST approved, which are still in development, the next generation um, uh, algorithms. That's a huge third party risk management challenge for any firm to, to deal with that. So my question is really around how do you really manage these third parties to deal with things like quantum you know, encryption risks or um, the advances in AI and, and how they are using AI uh, that may not always be visible unless you're doing a deeper dive in your third party risk management? Um, so tell us a little bit about how you're approaching kind of the third party risk management challenge. You know, I think that going back to where could you see AI help? I think that um, AI, large language models, things of that can actually help speed up some of the assessments that we do today, even if you're leveraging a consortium. I think they can speed some of those things up and then allow your teams to focus on that data movement in more in depth and understanding that. So making sure that only what is shared is only what needs to be shared in putting your third parties, and it's not every third party you use, but letting them know you want to understand how they are managing cryptographic materials, what their plans are for quantum. Because if if your environment is prepared for that, but you're, to your point, your third parties aren't, that's going to be a challenge. So I think it's a challenge across the, the across everything you touch today. People don't realize that even the communication and conversation we're having here is is riding on some of those technologies. So fundamentally for quantum, it changes every single connection that we have. It changes how we protect data. And it also, um, you know, can manifest as a risk when if data had been harvested prior and the quantum computers are that great, can they now break those traditional algorithms? And we've seen those traditional algorithms broken with traditional compute. That's still a risk, but that risk is going to be higher once those quantum computers need less qubits, et cetera, and become, you know, quite frankly, less expensive to break that encryption that we have today. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we've obviously covered a lot of ground. You're always clear, always thoughtful. I was just curious before we wrap up today, if there are any last thoughts you have that you haven't mentioned previously? No, I can't think of any, John. I think we've covered an incredible waterfront today. And thank you for being such a great moderator. Awesome. Well, next time you go on that Maserati or Ferrari on the Malibu Highway, please bring me along. (laughs) You got it. Absolutely. (laughs) Awesome. Well, listen, thank you all for joining our session today on this fireside chat with one of the country's leading CISOs of a major financial services firm. So thank you to the Cloud Security Alliance for inviting us to be a part of this program. Have a good day.